Welcome to the Global News Podcast, your source for the latest and most comprehensive coverage of global events, breaking news, and in-depth analysis. We are here to guide you through the top stories from around the world. Whether it's politics, economics, culture, or science. These are our main stories. Israel says it's discovered evidence the main Gaza hospital was being used as a Hamas command centre. MPs in Kenya approve a plan to send a thousand police officers to Haiti to help deal with gang violence. Also in this podcast, in Russia, seven years in prison for an artist protesting about the war in Ukraine. What this shows, Sonia says, is that there is terrifying repression in Russia and nothing left of freedom of speech. And we meet the young English footballer who thought his career was on the slide but who's now a hero across Pakistan. I probably just played football for fun. I didn't really think much of it, but to play on the world stage is a dream come true, really. We begin this podcast in Gaza, where after two days of searching Al-Shifa hospital, the Israeli army has released pictures they say back up claims the area was used as a Hamas command centre. Israel's chief military spokesman, Daniel Hagari, gave more details. Idea forces found a tunnel shaft in Shifa hospital, and engineering forces are currently uncovering the infrastructure there. We also found a vehicle that had been prepared for the massacre on October the 7th and didn't leave, and we found many weapons in it. I want to emphasize, a car of Hamas terrorists with many weapons within the grounds of Shifa Hospital. It was supposed to leave from there to the massacre of October the 7th. At the same time, IDF forces are continuing their activities in the Rantisi Hospital, and we're presenting to you today photos from a tunnel that is close to the hospital. Well, for many days now, Israel has justified its operations at those hospitals because they say that they were a hub for Hamas, something the militant group has strenuously denied. Osama Hamdan is a spokesman for Hamas based in Lebanon. All those weapons were not in Shifa. There is no no center or control room for Hamas in this hospital. We avoid all the hospitals all the time. Nick Beek is our correspondent in Jerusalem. He told us more about what the IDF have been saying about their operations in Gaza. Israel says it has two missions. The first, to wipe out Hamas. The second, to bring back the hostages who were taken on October the 7th. Tonight, the Israeli military are saying that they've retrieved the body of a 65-year-old woman, Judith Weiss, who was abducted on October the 7th. They say her body was found near the Al-Shifa hospital. They say at a structure adjacent to the hospital. We haven't got an exact location, but the Israeli military is saying that a number of weapons were there when her body was discovered and that her family have now been told what happened. Separately, there has been other work continuing at the hospital. Tonight, the Israelis are saying that they've found some sort of tunnel shaft. We don't know the significance of this and they haven't provided any more information. Certainly, there has been pressure on the Israelis to really substantiate this central claim. They've said that Hamas has a big command center right underneath the hospital and this was a justification for their huge military operation there hamas has always denied that in terms of what else has been happening during the day at the hospital well there are conflicting reports the israelis say that they've been working in a discreet methodical manner but a eyewitness told the bbc a journalist at the hospital said that he'd seen the israeli troops firing, firing in all directions, shooting, and also there were bulldozers that had been brought in and part of a hospital had been, part of a hospital wall had actually been destroyed. It's really difficult for us at the BBC to verify independently what's been happening here, but this is a a sense of what we've been hearing today from Gaza. Well, our correspondent in the southern Gazan town of Khan Yunis, Rushdi Abu Alouf, gave us details of the overall picture across the Strip. All communication is down tonight in Gaza and is going to be down for a long time because this time is not by Israel, it's because of the lack of fuel. The telecommunication company announced this morning that they are running out of fuel and since the Egyptians are only allowing about 25,000 litres of fuel to run the essential transporting of aid from Egypt into uh, Gaza, only 
is going to be used by the UN. Internet is down and the two mobile carrier here is down. The last call I made to our contact in Shifa Hospital, he was talking about tanks and hundreds of soldiers are storming the hospital again, searching from room to a room, calling loudspeakers, the people to go out. He said they were shooting randomly into the building, destroying many cars and also bulldozing some of the external wall to the hospital. He said tanks were inside the hospital and he was screaming on the phone saying that this is maybe the last call. Since four o'clock in the morning here, local time, no information was available from the Gaza city and the north. And here in the south, the sound of Israeli drones and sound of Israeli F-16 are flying overhead. Extremely uh, difficult to contact uh, people uh, in the north and in Gaza city and also communication among the people here. Uh, about a million people are displaced in the southern uh, Gaza tonight is also difficult. Rushdi Abu Alouf. Now to America, where President Biden is hosting leaders from the Asia-Pacific region, including Japan, South Korea and Taiwan, for the APEC summit in San Francisco. He told them APEC is a powerful and important international alliance. Today, 21 APEC economies make up more than 60% of the global GDP, or almost half the global trade. The choices we make are going to matter, it's not hyperbole to suggest, for the entire world. It comes a day after Joe Biden sat down for an eventful four hours with the Chinese president, Xi Jinping, to discuss military communications, restrictions on fentanyl ingredients and climate change. The idea was to put the relationship between the two giants back on something of an even keel, though calling Mr Xi a dictator at a news conference later probably didn't help matters. Our Washington correspondent, Gary O'Donoghue, told us it could be perceived as a bit of a diplomatic misstep. Definitely a bit of wobbly diplomacy and something that's kind of in character. He's done this sort of thing before and it's never very clear how deliberate it is. But I think if you take a look at the reaction of the Secretary of State, Tony Blinken, when that comment was made, he was sort of caught on camera. It wasn't something that perhaps the top diplomats wanted to hear from the president while President Xi was still in the same city, let alone in the same country. Uh, Much more sort of economic-focused programme today. A lot of talk about supply chains, the clean energy. You've got to remember, uh, American presidents are always talking about pivoting towards the Indo-Pacific, and that's because 60% of American exports go there. It's, you know, 40% of the world's population half of the world economy. And obviously it's very important for Mr Biden to keep close relationships with all these countries in the region, economically and diplomatically, because of the tensions with China. It is, and the Americans are very explicitly talking about economic and diplomatic connections with these parts of the world and trying to sort of promote things like workers' rights, which is not always very popular among some regimes. They're having a little bit of a hiccup because one of the deals they were hoping to sort of get to more of a conclusion this week on with 14 of the 21 economies that have evolved in APEC. That seems to be unravelling slightly over disagreements. So not everything is smooth sailing, but I think there will be some hope that they can try and mend perhaps some of those things that came to the fore, particularly during the pandemic, when you remember the whole problem with supply chains around the world. And we had like hundreds and hundreds of container ships lined up outside the port of California off Long Beach and not being able to sort of deliver goods to the American consumers. And it's that sort of thing that the president wants to avoid happening ever again. Gary O'Donoghue there. In Russia, you've got to be very brave indeed to condemn the war in Ukraine. Even referring to it as a war can get you arrested. Well, now a court in Russia has jailed a woman for seven years for replacing supermarket price tags with anti-war messages about Ukraine. Lawyers for Sasha Skochelenko, who's 33, had pleaded for her acquittal, saying she was chronically ill and could die in prison. Here's our Russia editor, Steve Rosenberg. In court in St. Petersburg, a reminder that inside Russia, those who publicly criticise the war in Ukraine are taking considerable risks. Guilty, said the judge. In the dock, in a metal cage, artist Sasha Skachelenko. She'd been arrested last year for replacing supermarket price tags with messages critical of Russia's war in Ukraine. Today, she was convicted of spreading false information about the Russian armed forces and sent to prison for seven years. 
Prosecutors accused her of being driven by political hatred of the military, of the Russian authorities and of the Russian president. But she had insisted that all she'd wanted was peace. On hearing the verdict, her supporters chanted disgrace. Among those in court was Sasha Skachilenko's partner, Sonia Subotina. She gave me her reaction. What this shows, Sonia says, is that there is terrifying repression in Russia and nothing left of freedom of speech. Since Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine, the authorities here have put in place a whole raft of laws to stifle dissent and silence criticism of what the Kremlin still calls its special military operation. Critics have been jailed for allegedly spreading fake news about the army, for discrediting the military and for treason. Steve Reisenberg. Britain's Foreign Secretary, the former Prime Minister David Cameron, has visited the Ukraine's Black Sea port of Odessa on his first official trip since taking out the role earlier this week. Speaking in Odessa, Lord Cameron said Britain would increase humanitarian support and medical supplies for Ukrainians, including those on the front lines. Following talks with President Zelensky in Kyiv earlier, he said that the UK would stand with Ukraine against Russia for as long as it takes to achieve victory. Our Ukraine correspondent James Waterhouse sent this report from Kyiv. Britain is one of Ukraine's staunchest allies, having provided billions of pounds of military aid, and that was reflected in Lord Cameron's reception by President Zelensky. The message he arrived with was simple. We will continue to give you the moral support, the diplomatic support, the economic support, but above all the military support that you need, not just this year and next year, but for however long it takes. The pair discussed weapons, arms manufacturing and security in the Black Sea. Russia's dominance around the Crimean Peninsula has been slightly weakened after British-supplied missiles hit key naval targets. There is even time for a reference to another former Prime Minister. I had some disagreements with my friend Boris Johnson, but we've known each other for 40 years, and his support for you was the finest thing that he and his government did. David Cameron then travelled to the southern port city of Odessa, where he visited a damaged cathedral and the opera house, complete with its orchestra. Ukraine is battling political fatigue among some Western allies, fuelled by a lack of movement on the front line. It also knows it must share the stage with another war in the Middle East. James Waterhouse. Pakistan's population of 230 million is the fifth biggest in the world. But in football, they're ranked 193rd, one below the island of Aruba, two above the Seychelles. There's no professional league in Pakistan. Despite that, for the first time, they made it through to the second round of the Football World Cup qualifiers. On Thursday, they played Saudi Arabia, conquerors of the world champions Argentina. And a number of British Pakistani players helped them get there. One of them, Harun Hamid, didn't quite make the grade at the second-tier English side Queen's Park Rangers, but he was still good enough to score the winning goal that got Pakistan through to Thursday's match. The BBC's Luke Wolfstenholm spoke to him at a football ground in the English town of Watford ahead of the game. So we're at the pitch where I pretty much grew up playing football with my dad, with my friends, by myself. After school, I used to come here pretty much every day. And I used to play football here, like, until the lights went off, you know, so it was like playing in the dark. Right now, you know, we're at the place where you started playing as a kid. Could you imagine playing international football? Not growing up, no. I probably just played football for fun. I didn't really think much of it, but to play on the world stage is a dream come true, really. And it's not just playing on the world stage, it's scoring the biggest goal probably in Pakistani footy history, right? But yeah, after I scored, I was just filled with adrenaline and it was a crazy feeling. I just went straight over to the fans and done a knee slide. So, yeah. <laughs> you're through, you're playing Saudi Arabia, who beat Argentina in the World Cup. Lionel Messi's Argentina, who went on to win it. That is it! Wow. Saudi Arabia! It's sensational! Argentina have been beaten! What a result at this World Cup! Must sound amazing as well, no? It's putting ourselves on the, the biggest stage in football and it's really going to test us. But I think this is what we need to grow as a footballing nation and to, to get onto the world stage. You're one of a few British-Pakistani players playing. 
is the hope to keep bringing more of them through? I mean, the hope to grow football in the country itself. Have you even spoken about that as a side? You know, I love both my countries, England and Pakistan. I'd like for more boys like myself, because there are a lot of talented young boys playing in England, to want to represent Pakistan. I think that's my dream, if we can get a side strong enough to compete at the highest level. Did you ever entertain playing for Pakistan as a, as a youngster? Do you know what, it's funny, because growing up I didn't even know they had a, a team. So it's an opportunity, you know, sometimes life presents yourself with opportunities and I had to take it. That report was by Luke Wollstenholm. And by the way, Pakistan lost 4-0 to Saudi Arabia, but uh, there are more group games to come, so not all hope is lost. Still to come on the podcast. It's a picture called Walkers with the Dawn and Morning, and it has just strolled into the record books. And I'm selling at 9,500,000. Sold. We find out why. Picture the scene. You're 12 years old, a talented ice hockey player, but despite your skill on the rink, you're not allowed to compete at the highest level of the sport. The reason? You're a girl. Amazing Sports Stories from the BBC World Service tells the story of Justine Blaney, the girl who fought to change the rules around mixed-sex ice hockey teams in Ontario, Canada. Listen now by searching for Amazing Sports Stories wherever you get your BBC podcasts. About a 1,000 Kenyan police officers could soon be travelling 12,000 kilometres west to Haiti. That's after members of parliament in Nairobi approved a plan to help Haiti try to regain control of the streets from dozens of armed gangs that have been terrorising the population for years. Haiti called for international help earlier in the year, saying that its security forces are overwhelmed with the scale of the violence. I asked the Haitian journalist... Widlaw Merancourt, how much of a challenge the Kenyan forces will be up against? The Kenyan mission will face many difficulties. The insecurity climate in Haiti is dire. The biggest slum in Haiti, Cite Soleil, that is today in turmoil because the Iska gang leader is dead and his territory now is up for grab and competing gang leaders are trying to, you know, control this territory that has many businesses and you have the civil population that is, you know, in some, some sort of sandwich between gangs trying to compete for territory. So it's thousands of people leaving their houses and leaving their homes because of gang violence. It's a lot of kidnapping. It's a lot of gangs that are extremely powerful with, you know, rifles and machine guns that many brought from the US. It's also an internal problem with the mission because we are talking about Kenyan police officers who do not speak Creole. They don't speak French. And they are coming in a Caribbean country where people speak another language, have another culture, and it's unclear how they will engage with these people. That's the first thing. The second thing is about how many police officers are we talking about for this mission in total. We have gangs that are extremely powerful. They are numerous. And so far, what we are hearing is about a thousand Kenyan. So there is this component also. But what do Haitians feel about the possibility of Kenyan police arriving? Is there a degree of content there? The Haitian population is split when it comes to this mission. Many people are criticizing, actually, what I just mentioned about the number of police officers will be part of this mission. Remember, in 2004, when the UN sent soldiers for a mission in Haiti, there were about 10,000. And the complexities and the insecurity in Haiti was not as dire So people are extremely skeptical if this mission will be successful. But at the same time, you have an insecurity problem that lasts for years and people are looking for some relief. Whitlaw Merencourt in Haiti. The International Court of Justice has just ordered Syria to stop all acts of torture and other cruel treatment, including the use of chemical weapons. It is the first international judgment linked to the civil war that started in 2011, since when half a million people have been killed. Anna Holligan reports. The judges declared that Syria must do everything within its power to prevent any violations of the Convention Against Torture and ensure that any evidence of torture is preserved. 
Former detainees have alleged that government forces routinely use torture methods, including electric shocks, pulling out nails and teeth, sexual violence, as well as the systematic deprivation of food, water and medical treatment. Anna Holligan. As hundreds of people in Iceland continue to live away from their homes after a mass evacuation near a volcano, the BBC has been told that the whole area could face decades of instability. Hundreds of small earthquakes and fears of an impending eruption have led the town of Grindavik to be emptied. The warning comes from Dr Matthew Roberts, who works for the Icelandic Meteorological Office. He's been speaking to our correspondent, Jessica Parker. Magma coursed in, into the ground fracturing rock over a distance of 15 kilometres. It was an unprecedented situation, something that we haven't measured or even seen in modern times, yet we knew from the geological record that such dike, so-called dike intrusions could occur. The speed at which it occurred was, was phenomenal. This was a propagation of magma over a, di- over a distance of many kilometres happening in just a few hours, cutting straight beneath the town of Grindavik, almost like an underground freight train. This type of eruption, or potential eruption, we think happened before centuries ago. Yeah. Yeah, exactly, and it would, what we're seeing now is a repeat. But what, what we're seeing from a, from a human perspective are geological processes that are happening so rapidly in a matter of hours. This is landscape-changing processes. So the town of Grindavik, at least the western part of Grindavik, has subsided by over one metre. Most of this happened on Friday evening and into Saturday, and the, and the ground deformation continues. So in terms of the people of Grindavik, do you think they'll ever be able to go home? I hope so. It's too early to say at the moment, though. What we, again, what we see is unprecedented uh, activity. This is a, 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 a so-called uh, magmatic intrusion beneath a populated area. There are very few examples of this globally. We know here in Iceland that this process has occurred in the past. This is the first time that a populated area has been in harm's way. And we know from the ground deformation we're measuring today that at least it will take many days, if not a number of weeks, for everything to settle down before an assessment can be made about building safety. And if there was an eruption, I mean, worst case scenario, I suppose, is there are lava flows. Uh, can you just give us a picture of what that, that could look like, yeah. theoretically? So, so uh, probably one of the worst eruptions to contend with would be quite a... Uh, a low intensity eruption that lasts for a long time. So lava pouring from a series of fissures, not just one location, but but from a number of, of craters, and the discharge is not particularly high, but the duration is exceptionally long, so weeks and weeks. And if that were to occur, there would be lava flow to the south, possibly towards Grindavik, and also possibly north and westwards towards other facilities, such as the nearby uh, Svartengi power station, the Blue Lagoon and other locations. If this doesn't result in an eruption almost certainly on a timescale of months to within a year, there will be another eruption on the peninsula. And progressively, we we expect to see volcanic eruptions uh, along the peninsula, not just repeatedly in the same location. And this is perhaps one example now of of the remarkable changes and and unexpected consequences that can occur. So the instability, the seismic activity, potential eruptions along the Reculus Peninsula could go on for decades? Yes, absolutely. Could could last probably on a timescale of decades. I mean, that's very bad news for the people that live there, presumably. Yeah, absolutely. And it the results in other hazards as well. As While all this unrest is occurring, there are uh, stress accumulates in the Earth's crust. This results in earthquakes and earthquakes that could occur closer to the capital region, uh, earthquakes that could um, affect roads and so on. And, and ultimately, we have to, as we've been doing for many years now, planning for volcanic activity, planning aggressively to be able to defend areas, to increase monitoring. And this is exactly where we are. We're, at, we're almost at war with Mother Nature yet again in Iceland. That was Dr Matthew Roberts. Now to an auction house in New York City. $9,500,000 with Lisa Dennison at $9,500,000. And I'm selling at $9,500,000. Sold. And that is the moment the gavel came down for a record sale price for a work of art by an African-born artist. It's called Walkers with the Dawn and Morning, a swirling abstract piece by the Ethiopian-American artist Julie Meretu. Will Ross, the BBC's Africa editor, told me more about it and her. It's quite typical of Julie Moretu's work in that it's a vast piece and she tends to use a phenomenal number of different strokes across the canvas that are layered on top of each other. And if you look back at some of her other pieces of work, they are on a colossal scale. And I've just been seeing one where 
she was up painting on a canvas and she was using the kind of apparatus you might use on a skyscraper to do some window cleaning, that kind of a sort of cherry picker thing that would be on the outside of a building. So an enormous scale, but she is certainly sort of at the top of the game, as it were, having just broken her own record because just recently she sold a piece for $9.3 million dollars at auction. She was born in Ethiopia back in 1970, but then several years later, her family fled due to conflict there and disruption um, and has been based in the United States, but also has a gallery in Berlin. But this is a record for something going under the hammer from an artist born in Africa. Given that she left Ethiopia such a long time ago as a young girl, Could this be seen as a a victory for African art per se, do you think? Well, I think there will be a celebration amongst the art community, especially the African art community. I've been speaking to Hannah O'Leary, who's the head of modern and contemporary African art at Sotheby's, the auction house, and she says that while... Africa in general is sort of way behind Asia in terms of the value of the art and the interest and the number of sales. It is growing at an extraordinary rate. And there is huge buyer interest in countries like Nigeria, but also it tends to mirror where the economies are strong. So South Africa, Nigeria, Egypt. But she also said there's massive growth now of interesting art from countries like Kenya, Uganda, Ethiopia and Zimbabwe, where you could say, you know, economically it's not doing so well. The actor Tom Hanks, whose film roles include Apollo 13, about the failed mission to the moon, is part of a team behind a new exhibition which opens in London next month. The show, called The Moonwalkers, uses light and audio technology to tell the stories of the Apollo and Artemis space programmes to our closest celestial neighbour. Tom Hanks has been talking to our arts correspondent, David Silito. It's only a small step, but it's also a giant leap at the same time. Okay, leave me, leave me. Spirit of adventure about you now. You know, when someone asks if you fancy going on a journey to the moon with Tom Hanks, you say yes. Tom really knows his space. It's been a passion from childhood, and this is his show. An astronaut's eye view of what it was like to be on an Apollo mission. And it all began when Tom first saw this space being used for a David Hockney show. And he had an idea. I, I probably actually asked a question. I said, if, if we could walk into this painting, could we, could we actually walk on the moon as well? So that's when you had the idea. You walked in and you usually thought, this could be the moon. You could put people on the moon in a way that has never, ever, ever, ever been done. But this isn't just history. It's also a fanfare for what's about to happen. Good morning, good afternoon. What is it exactly up there now? Tom has been working with NASA, meeting the astronauts for the next moon mission, which is due to take off next year. But there is a question. This, going into space, it's an indulgence. There are so many other things we could be spending our money on, so many more important things in life. Mm -hmm. Is it still important? What does it do for an individual? You could argue that maybe not much, but what, what does it do for the cause of humanity? Something magnificent. It takes us to this next place. There's going to come a time when someone is going to live permanently on places like the moon or in space. And we will become interplanetary beings. And isn't that what we're supposed to do as human beings? We're always, it, supposed, to, we're always supposed to get out of the cave to see what is there. And we have never not found something magnificent as well as a magnification of, of ourselves. What do you want people to take away from this? Awe. Wonder. That's it. And at the end, a chance to really look at the main attraction. Wouldn't you like to take a cruise in the Sea of Crises? Wouldn't you like to go visit the ocean storm? I have sailed the Sea of Crises Uh, We all have, we all have, haven't we, yeah. When you get up just a little bit closer, it's, it's quite stunning, that magnificent desolation. And that's what it is. David Silito. And that's all from us for now, but there will be a new edition of the Global News Podcast later. If you want to comment on this podcast or the topics covered in it, you can send us an email. The address is globalpodcast at bbc.co.uk. You can also find us on X, formerly known as Twitter, at Global News Pod. This edition was mixed by Holly Palmer and the producer was Stephanie Tillotson. The editor is Karen Martin. I'm Nick Barnes, and until next time, goodbye. 